If you had to name a famous volcano, then the chances are it would be Krakatoa and its cataclysmic eruption in 1883. Star of films and books, even if it's not east of Java. Let's look at this classic eruption and contrast it with another one, also deadly, just back in 2018. This is a story of two volcanoes, of Krakatoa and Krakatoa's child, Anak Krakatoa. The history and notoriety attracts tourists, so let's see why. But it won't be just about eruptions, it's also about tsunamis. Now, no journey around Southeast Asia's Ring of Fire would be complete without taking in Krakatoa, or perhaps more properly, Krakatau. It lies on a major tectonic break, the Great Sumatran Fault. Indeed, so do most of the other volcanoes on Sumatra. So let's zoom into the Sunda Strait. Here's the fault system and it kinks, creating a so-called rightward step over, which means the crust under the strait is being pulled apart. We can see this in a seismic profile. Lots of faulting. So the crust here is predisposed to locate volcanoes in these volcanic arc systems. So let's now spend some time considering the 1883 eruption. It had a volcanic explosive index of six and is known to have killed at least 36,000 people. In the 19th century, this region, including Krakatoa, lay in the Dutch East Indies on a major shipping lane. And so the Sunda Strait around the time of the eruption was reasonably well surveyed. And this is the island of Krakatoa before the 1883 eruption and afterwards. Look at the scale. The island has been blown apart, but it didn't blow up in just one go. It was a history of eruptions. This is the only photograph of the eruption and it's only after an early part of its history. So let's construct the rest of it. Through 1883, there are a series of minor eruptions across the island before a significant eruption, which is seen in the photograph, began in late May. The eruption calmed down a bit, and indeed tourist trips were organised to take a look. But then in mid-June, the main summit cone was blown off, and the eruptions began to build in earnest. The last visit by a surveyor was in early August. Fortunately, they didn't return. The eruptions really began to take off in late August and it reached a climax through the morning of the 27th. There were four distinct eruptions that destroyed the island. The final collapse sent a pyroclastic flow right across the Sunda Strait, killing thousands on the islands and the south coast of Sumatra. But the biggest eruption happened a little earlier, at around 10 a.m. An explosion, a noise, thought to be the loudest ever experienced in all of human history. The explosion was heard over 3,000 kilometres away in Perth, Australia, and 4,800 kilometres away across the Indian Ocean on Il Rodriguez, where it was thought to be cannon fire from a nearby ship. Given the speed of sound, it would have taken this sound wave over four hours to have travelled across the Indian Ocean. Within 100 kilometres of Krakatoa, the noise was estimated at over 180 decibels. Bear in mind that standing next to a jet engine is 150 decibels. Windows were blown out. And within 40 kilometres, sailors on ships were made permanently deaf. So how do we know all this happened? Much of the key information comes from Dutch geologist Roger Verbeek stationed with the colonial Dutch government in what is modern-day Jakarta. He conducted the geological forensics and collated witness statements. 
he surveyed the relief of the Krakatoan Islands. Profiling the residual volcano, incorporating the geology of the various eruptions and their deposits. He tracked the extent of the erupted ash and he also collected information on the associated tsunamis. These are Verbeek's maps of inundation and destruction by the tsunami waves and we'll have more on this shortly. But Verbeek wasn't alone. At the time in Indonesian waters was Captain Foley Vereka on his first command on HMS Magpie. He'd heard the explosions and in October sailed into the Sunda Strait through thick masses of floating pumice stones and he surveyed profiles of the residual volcanic edifice. And so Krakatoa became global news and Thomas Huxley then President of the Royal Society, quickly set up a committee to find out all that could be learnt about the eruption. And this was already having effects across the world. The report of the committee that Huxley set up included lots of findings published by Verbeek, like his map, and reconstructed the evolution of the volcano from a pre-eruption caldera to its final excavated form. They also speculated on its ancient form as a large stratovolcano and the original formation of the caldera long before 1883, so that an evolution of the volcanic complex could be drawn out. But Krakatoa was not just a volcanic eruption. The eruptions were accompanied by powerful tsunamis. The Dutch steam gunboat Beru was at anchor of Teluk Betan port and was swept on shore, first by one wave and then by a second one, which swept it over three kilometers up the valley, finishing up over 20 meters above sea level. The greatest tsunamis swept the Sunda Straits wiping out lots of coastal communities. The Vlakenhoek Lighthouse survived, a wave striking 15 metres up the structure, but the surrounding lodges were swept away along with the people there. So Verbeek mapped all this out. That lighthouse is out here with a run up of 15 metres, nearly 100 kilometres from the source volcano. Elsewhere in southern Sumatra, the run-ups were over 20 metres. On Java, the port of Anjar had a 10 metre wave, while Merak was wiped out by a staggering 35 metre wave. Much of these differences, in part, reflect the local coastal geometries. The progress of the greatest tsunami can be reconstructed, propagating out along the Sonda Strait sweeping north into the Java Sea and out into the Indian Ocean. Some two and a half hours later, at the site of modern Jakarta, the tsunami struck with a run-up of 2.4 metres, killing hundreds of people. And the tsunami swept out across the Indian Ocean. And in the following hours and days, it was recorded in many of the world's ocean basins. The multiple tsunamis caused most of the deaths associated with the 1883 eruptions. But there remains a debate as to how these tsunamis were generated. It's problematic because the water depth in the Sunda Strait is quite shallow, so it's hard to shift the huge volumes of water needed. So was it a single big explosion, cavitating the whole area as the magma chamber collapses? Was it caused by a flank collapse? maybe for some of the smaller ones, or even a collapse of a pyroclastic flow with a vast footprint slamming down and expelling the seawater. Perhaps all these mechanisms played out at various times. There were, of course, many tsunamis accompanying the various stages of individual eruptions.
So why were the eruptions so explosive? Well, they're characteristic of many subduction volcanoes. It's the tectonic setting and it's characterised by very viscous magma, which means that gas bubbles can't escape until the whole lot goes bang. This is some of the material from the 1883 eruptions. It's a rock called Ryodacite. It's actually a piece of bubbly pumice, which was found on the shores of Kenya on the far side of the Indian Ocean. Which leads nicely into considering the longer range effects of all these eruptions in 1883. As we've already seen, the greatest sound ever experienced by humans was associated with the main explosion on the 27th of August. This is the mapping of the audible sound produced in the Royal Society report. Now, the chair of the committee, George Simons, was a celebrated atmospheric scientist and the committee collated air pressure measurements made in stations all over the world. All recorded the pressure wave and at long ranges at frequencies inaudible to human ears, but detected on barometers. Amazingly, the pressure wave from Krakatoa went right around the world and reflected all the way back. And there were several reverberations of this atmospheric shock wave. And the atmosphere changed in other ways. Ash and dust formed a plume that over 16 days wrapped all the way around the equator and then it spread into higher latitudes. Famously, through the later part of 1883 and into 1884, the sky was reddened at sunset, as charted in these scientific sketches. And perhaps most famously, thought to inspire Edward Munch in his depiction of sky. And the climate changed too, with significant cooling across the Northern Hemisphere. In southern Spain, the San Fernando Observatory kept daily records of sunshine hours, and this is the maximum possible daylight in southern Spain through the seasons. And this is the record of daylight hours experienced at the observatory. Let's pick the curve and look at its change through time. Tracking summer highs and winter lows, there's a distinct dip, a reduction in sunshine hours, in the seasons following the Krakatoa eruption. Some call this volcanic winter. It's now known that the climatic effects not simply about ash in the atmosphere, but aerosols, especially sulphur dioxide emissions that came from the eruptions. Although 1883 is famous and has significant climatic impacts, it is by no means unusual. It had an assessed volcanic explosivity index of six, and there have been others nearly as big since. In 2022, the eruption at Honga Tonga had a VEI of five. Its largest explosion was heard right across the Pacific in Anchorage, Alaska. The plume height was some 58 kilometers and the erupted volume was between six and 10 cubic kilometers. Six people were killed by the tsunami, including two in Chile. The 1991 eruption of Pinatubo had a VEI of six and over a series of eruptions ejected over 10 cubic kilometres of rock and an estimated 17 megatons of sulphur dioxide. The eruption column was over 40 kilometres high. But let's go back to Krakatoa. Through the end of 1883, the eruptions subsided away, leaving bits of volcanoes cleaved apart. So you can see, like Verbeek recorded, right inside the old volcanic cones. But the area didn't remain quiet long. In the decades following 1883, a new volcanic cone grew through the ruins of the old islands. Anak Krakatoa, Krakatoa's child. And in 2018, eruptions increased. On the 22nd of December, the volcano collapsed, sliding off into the old remnant caldera. The resulting tsunami killed over 400 people, leaving a stump of a volcano behind. So this was a flank collapse, 
pushing off lots of rock into the sea. And the tsunami struck the coast of Java. Since then, volcanologists have tried to study the processes. First, modelling the eruption and flank collapse. And then the tsunami it caused, spreading through the ancient remnant caldera and out into the Sunda Strait. As in 8083, it was the tsunamis that killed the most people. This time, unequivocally due to flank collapse with its associated eruption. This eruption had a VEI of three, and it shows how important volcanogenic tsunamis are as hazards to populations. But the effects could be mitigated by better planning and preparation. Here's an exciting study looking at the impact of having coconut plantations along the coast. With the effects of a tsunami modelled on a typical shoreline, a village not on the beach, but a little inland. And the model shows how a tsunami inundation is modulated by simple plantations, plotting wave height against time for different places along the transect. At the front of the plantation, a wave crashes in, staying high. The wave gradually wanes. Meanwhile, the wave reaching the back of the plantation is much diminished. And further back too, the wave is almost flattened off. So having open plantations of coconut palms is an effective way of protecting populations from the risks of moderate tsunamis. Still otherwise killers, as in 2018. The volcanic system of Krakatoa, parent and child, is still there. They are dangerous, but many of the risks can be reduced by better monitoring information and planning. Active geological processes make for spectacular landforms that tell stories of earth processes. Geologists draw together information from a broad range of science and society and even art to understand volcanoes and the impacts on atmosphere and global climate to help communities live with the threats from these earth processes. We can't stop volcanoes erupting, but at least we can learn to live alongside them more safely.